Oh, I feel like I'm excited every week, but something is breaking through in this region that is of the spiritual nature, and us as a family are a part of that. Amen? Amen? Oh, how good is that? How good is that? Oh, I feel it. I don't know if everyone else felt it, but during that worship, it's like, you know what? God is the winner, not the enemy. God won. The enemy has been defeated. Amen? Jesus went into the grave, and he came up out of the grave because he had risen. And that spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Get hold of it. Get hold of the power of that. Amen? Oh, so good. Sorry. So good. I'm excited. Hot topics. Halved our church in one week. No, I'm kidding. People did tell me they're away. Um, <laughs> so we do have a lot of families away. You better be joining us online. I'll check. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. All right. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Um, hot topics. I love it. To make you uncomfortable while you sit and sweat in your seat. Should have done it in summer because in summer this building becomes a furnace and you'll actually sweat in your seat. And you'll be like, oh, I'm convicted. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so I got a deep, deep tissue massage the other day, right? And so in between like your workout sets, you're like eight weeks, and you have a week off and you do eight weeks, right? And your muscles get really tight. And I used to do like massages all the time. Um, and I realized how much they suck. <laughs> like they get into the tissue. So you're like, your muscles get knots, right? And they find this knot and they get into the tissue and they push all this. And you feel like you're going to die. Honestly, it's horrible. It's not a remedial massage. Like, I do not know how someone can be so strong in their fingers. You know, like, like there's a lot of flesh. I've got a lot of flesh to get through. <laughs> and they get there anyway. It's, it's oh, like, whatever. Huh? It sucks. But it's so good afterwards, isn't it? You just feel so loosey and... Whew. And it's floating. It's so good. And my hope is that through this series, we feel the same, right, with the hot topics. It's like there might be some knots in us in the way that we follow Jesus, or there might be some stuff that we just might not be getting, right, that God wants us to get. And he's saying, I want you to get a massage, right? I want you to get to the hard spots, and it might be uncomfortable in the process. And through your head, the enemy might be screaming at you, saying, it's not for me. This message is not for me. You're silly. I don't want to listen to it, but just lean into it. Except the short-term pain for the long-term gain, right? Because we are, we are leaky vessels, aren't we? We're leaky vessels, but God wants good things for you. That's the good news, is that God wants good things for you. So if it feels a little bit uncomfortable, great. If there's some transforming going on, fantastic. Lean into it, because ultimately, it's for your benefit. Amen? So last week, we spoke on money, right? And this week, we're going to speak on tithes and offerings, because if I don't do it the week after money, I'm never going to do it. So... I'm just going to do it. Let's go for it. Um, and I think there's some things in the Bible that we're like, hmm, that doesn't really apply to me. That's Old Testament stuff. You know, that's a law. We don't follow the law anymore. We're under Jesus. Woo! I was like that. Do you know what I mean? So I just want to um, make it clear. Are you commanded to tithe? No, you're not. Should you tithe? Yes, you should. <laughs> Is it just about the money? It's not about the money. Right? I said this last week, and I want to make it very, very clear. It's not about the money. I'm not asking any of you to tithe more. I'm not asking you to give more to the church. Right? This is between you and God. Let's just put that out there. Right? It's between you and God. It's got nothing to do with us trying to, whatever you think tithing message is about. Right? But it's about what does the tithe say about our heart towards God. Right? Okay? But let's go on this journey together, because I've been on this journey, and I want to go on this journey together. And I want to discuss the difference between tithes and offerings. Because I, there was a time where I thought it was the same thing, you know? But it's not. Um, and I want to go on this journey where we as a church understand that we are irrationally generous with what we have. That is something as a church body I vision us being, you know? That we are irrationally generous with our money. We are irrationally generous with our time, with our resources. Not just for the local church, but for our community and anywhere that we've been put into, that we're just givers, that's who we are, right, because it reflects Christ, okay, should we do that, all right, I'm going to pray, Lord, I just pray that this message is delivered by you, Father, I pray for the hearts in this room, the hearts that are listening online, Lord, I just pray that we just want you, Father, we don't want anything fabricated or materialistic or whatever, Lord, we just want you, Father, and it's just amazing to me, Lord, that 
that while you're in heaven, you chose to come down and give everything so that we could be free, so that we could see a victory, Father. So I just ask, Lord, that this message is of you, that I just, anything that's of me, Lord, any ego, any arrogance, Father, I just ask for you to shred away right now and just drop away, Lord, that if there's anything of me, Lord, even when I look down and read a note, Lord, that it's of me, Father, I just, just ask for your spirit to speak, Lord, and just say, ignore it, because we just want you, Father. We just want you. So, Lord, minister to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I am pa- I'm passionate about this because... I'm passionate about this <laughs> because when, when, I, when I first learned about the tithe, right, and it came up on the screen and said tithes and offerings, I'm like, oh, well, why don't they just call it offerings? Or why do they have to use two different words? You know, it's the same thing. And I remember, like, a Sunday morning, I was, like, running around, and I was like, Emma, we need some money to put in the bucket. Like, people are going to see. So silly. I'm just being vulnerable, right? So I grabbed $20, and, and when the bucket came, I like, scrunched it up, right? I scrunched it up really tight so no one could see, and I made sure I put it right at the bottom and drop it. So even the person like, like this, that it, that's like this with the bucket, doesn't see how much I put in, you know? And I realized the Bible actually says, do not be compelled to give. Do not give under compulsion, right? If you're giving under compulsion because you feel like the bucket's being passed and the person next to you gave, don't do it. Because the Bible says not to. Because the, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I saw this picture, right? Who knows the difference between, yeah, next one, an alpaca and a llama? Right? It's like tithes and offerings, isn't it? Like, I don't know. I still don't know. The picture's up there. I still don't know which is which. I didn't research it. I generally do not know. But one is a llama and one is an alpaca. They look the same, don't they? And <laughs> so it's, it's a bit like tithes and offerings. They are different, but they, look, they, they seem the same, right? <laughs> so I just, I just like the picture. <laughs> so we're going to call tithes llamas and let's call offerings alpacas, all right? So let's deal with the llama first, all right? I think I like the alpaca better, but I think it's just because I like the name better. Do you know what I mean? And I've been trying to convince Emma for three years to get one because I really want one, an alpaca, <laughs> but... <laughs> She said no, and I don't think it's very fair because she wanted a dog and we got one. So I sacrificed for her, you know. But I researched it. You can have an alpaca in a residential property. Like, it's fine. So, anyway. So, what is a tithe? So, the Hebrew word is a tenth, right? The most common scripture of a tithe is in Malachi 3, 10 to 12. So, a tithe actually means a tenth, a tenth of what you have, right? That's why it calls tithe. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Woo! Ah, I love it. So... This scripture from Malachi was a prophet towards Israel. I just, I just want to make that clear, right? It doesn't actually mean to all people. It's a prophet, but we can still learn by what it says. Does that make sense? Okay. In Proverbs 3, 9, it says, Honour the Lord with your wealth. That's what it says. I'm going to go back to Malachi, don't worry. It says, Honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Right? Another funny story, because I just like stories, right? And I overanalyze everything. So when I go get my hair cut, this is very shallow. So I'm just saying, look, I'm vulnerable. I have weaknesses. I, I know, you know, before I was a pastor, I used to be a man. Um, so, you know, broken like the rest of you. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I was like, when, whenever I go to get my hair cut, I try and get in there. So it opens at 7.30. And I try and get up in there for a nine o'clock appointment on a Saturday, right? And it's not by accident. I get in there for nine o'clock because by that time, I feel like the person that cuts my hair has had one, maybe two cuts, so she's warmed up with her fingers, right? Um, and she is in the most primest time of her day to cut hair. Does that make sense? So she's not too tired. I will never go get my hair cut at four o'clock because by that time, Right? She's cut like 50 people's hair and she's going to be tired and she's probably going to do a sloppy job. So I try and get in there for 9 o'clock, get my hair cut when she's at her prime. 
right? That's her best. And this is, God also wants our best. He wants our first fruits. He wants the first things that we have to be His. And this is not a new thing. This is not, people are, oh, that's a Messianic law, and, you know, the law said that. No, it's not, because with Cain and Abel, back in Genesis 4, right, it says this, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, the first, and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel, Abel and his offering. Before any law about tithing, before anything like that, Abel knew, give him the first, give him the best. Give God the best. He owns it all anyway. Amen? He owns it all anyway. Okay? Everything in your life, everything in your life, God should be first. That's why I try and make sure every time I wake up in the morning, and I'm not that holy, sometimes I forget, right? I am praying to God and I give Him the day. I'm giving Him my first minutes of the day. Is church the first thing you do in your week or is it the last thing you do in your week? That's a good heart check, right? Are we giving God the best or are we giving God our leftovers? Because God wants our best, right? If we give God the best, He will bless the rest. Amen? Amen? But if you're doing the 90% in your own strength and then giving in the 10%, what is there to bless? It's all done. It's all dusted, right? Because you've walked through life thinking that it's in your strength. But it's not. And God wants it, right? First tithe was in Genesis 14, 19 to 20, before any law, right? And he blessed him and said, Blessed be, by, be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and be blessed by God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. There's something about this. There's something about this, right? That goes deeper than any law, that goes deeper than any command. There is something about this tenth of everything, right? Are we giving him our first fruits or our leftovers? First fruits or leftovers, right? God wants to be first in our lives. But here's the tip, right? God doesn't need your money. I want to be really clear on that. God doesn't need your money. He is not up there paving the road of gold in heaven, right? And then going, oh gosh, angel, I'm out of gold. What should we do? I'm out of gold for my road. I know, I'll tithe, I'll tithe the people down there and I'll get gold up. That's what I'll do. It didn't happen, right? It didn't happen. God is not out of money. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't, he doesn't need your money, right? So why tithe? Why tithe? It tells us in Deuteronomy 14, 23, right? At the end it says, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. It's a heart thing. He's trying to teach us something. He's trying to give us something, right? The tithe is not for God. He doesn't need your money, but He desperately wants your heart. He desperately wants your heart. He desperately wants your heart. He wants you to give everything to Him. Everything, right? Everything. He wants you to be first and he wants you to be obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience to the law is better than sacrifice. Right? So why is there a tithe? Because God wants us to be obedient to him and he wants to bless us. When you don't tithe, you're not robbing God. You're robbing God of the opportunity to bless you. That's what you're doing. Right? Let's go back to Malachi 3.10. It says... And let's, let's just unpack this a little bit, okay? Let's unpack it. Bring the whole tithe, full, full tithe, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, right? The, sto the, the Hebrew word for storehouse is bayit. It's the only Hebrew word I can pronounce properly, right? And it means dwelling, building, temple, family. That's what it means. The local church. The local church, right? God obviously wants people to be spiritually led, that's why I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Everything needs to come out of the local church. The way that, you know, if we're transformed in here and we're a body and we're tight and we want to serve the needy and we want to be like Jesus out there, it starts here as a family, as a community. Amen? Amen? Then we can flow out and serve the community. That's why I'm so passionate about building a community that love God, that build a community that feel needs of each other, that we are spiritual fillers, contributors, not consumers, right? Because the enemy hates it and we'll bind so closely together that the, the enemy just can't come near us, 
right? And then out of that, we serve the community, right? And it's interesting in the Old Testament when they talk about tithing, every th- three years they'd have this festival, right, where they would feed the hungry, they would feed the widows, anyone that's on the fringes, they would say, come, right, because our people have been faithful and take the tithe. That's what they did with it. They gave it to the needy. They gave it to the community, right? And in the New Testament, when they gave the money to the churches, they gave it to the people that were in need. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Always look at the reason, right? Because the law was given so that um, we can um, do what God wants us to do, right? Okay? Amen? Right? But we could never measure up, hence we had Jesus. How good is that? Right? How good is that? And I I just want to say that, I don't know if everyone knows this, but this church is completely self-funded. Completely self-funded from everyone that's here. Amen? We only exist because of everyone here that gives. And I think that deserves a round of applause. Right? So, good on you guys. You know what? Own it because we are serving God. We are serving God. Right? Um, And this might sound a little bit funny if you weren't here before the music um, and not know what I'm talking about. But through the missions that we give, right, we have given over $35,000. Because of you, because of you, right? Which is 10% of what we get. We tithe over there to build lolly shops, right? Yes, I said lolly shops. Come ask me about what I mean later, okay? All right. At the moment, we're supporting five lolly shop owners a year planting three lolly shops every week. Every week, right? That's 15 lolly shops. That is amazing. Just think about that for a moment, right? They would not exist. Right? They are getting meals delivered. Right? They are getting fed. They are getting respite. To, I think it's affected over like 35,000 people. That is amazing. That is amazing. Imagine how many souls might have been saved. Right? Amen? Amen? So good. So good. But I feel God calling us to do more in our community. I feel God calling us to do more. I really do. To reach the fringes. To reach our community. To be the light in this world. Amen? Amen? Because people will know you from your fruits. People will know you from your fruits. Okay, so what happens in Malachi? After it says this, right? One of the, first, one of the only times in the Bible that God says, put me to the test. Right? And I want us really to view the next couple of verses with some spiritually mature glasses on because we should be giving because we want to be obedient to God not because we're going to get blessings. God is not a lottery machine where we put a dollar in and we get 10 out, right? Amen? But God will bless you because God is a God of abundance. Amen? He says, put me to the test, right? So what happens? Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, so if you obey me, what will happen? If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Until there is no more need. God is saying 90% of your income with God's blessing is going to go way further than 100% without. Way further. Right? Will the floodgates open if you start giving, if you start obeying God? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it won't. But maybe it will. In Proverbs 11.24, it says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds, and he should give what, sorry, he, another withholds what he should give and only suffers wants. Isn't that amazing? When we withhold, when we feel like there's a scarcity in the world, there's not enough to go around, we have to hold what we have, we can't give, what do we suffer? We always want more. We talked about that last week, didn't we? Rich is a moving line. We always want, we always want, we always want, right? You never actually get there, you never actually get rich. But if you want to be used by God and you want to be a tool by God and you want to give and you want to give, what do you think God's going to do? Oh, this guy wants to give, wants to do what I want him to do as my vessel, so I'm going to what? I'm going to equip him to do my work. That's what God's going to do. He's going to equip you to do his work, but he knows your heart. And you say, oh, I'm going to give and I'm going to check my balances and see if I get more. Man, he's not going to use you, right? It's not going to mean anything. But if you truly want to be used by God, if our heart is to complete his mission, his mission, not our mission, his mission. He will equip you. Amen? He will equip you. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 9, 6 to 8, the point is this. 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. It comes back to your heart attitude towards God. Do you truly believe that He is your provider? Do you truly believe that He is the God of abundance? Right? Or do you not give because you're scared about paying that bill or helping that person and I can't right now, I'll do it when I'm in a better situation, I'll do it when I'm not struggling, right? Because I'm the one in control of my own circumstance. No, forget about what you have. Forget about the money you have. Forget about the possessions you have and say, you know what, God, it's all for you. But we're not going to give willy-nilly. We're not going to be irresponsible because we're being called to be good stewards, but we're going to be obedient, right? We're going to talk about that in a second. It says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. There's a calculation here. I'm going to give this percentage of my income. I've decided it and I'm going to be obedient in that. Right? It says, has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. If you feel like you're compulsed because I'm going on about it, don't give. I'll just put that out there right now. Don't give. For God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you have all sufficiency in all things at all times. What a promise. What a promise. You may abound in every good work. It's not just money, right? It's everything in your life. It's everything in your life. Right? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Right? The second thing in Malachi, can we go back to Malachi, if we can? The second thing, it says... So that's the first thing that will happen, right? If you get your heart right. Second thing, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. I will rebuke the devourer. You get your heart right towards me and I'll give you your protection. Amen? If, he, if God is for us, who could be against us? Right, we sang that song in the worship, I'm going to see a victory. It is one. It is one. It is one. He's there saying, I am your protector. I will protect you. I will protect you. Give, give me everything and I will protect you. Because I am a good God, not a bad God. It's our heart attitude towards the things that we have. It's about giving God everything. Amen? It's a principle. You don't have to. You're not commanded to. It's not a law. We are under grace. We are under Jesus Christ. Amen? Right? But God is asking you to. And it should be an overflow of your worship for Him. An overflow of your love for Him. Right? Amen? Amen? So let's look at the alpaca. Let's look at offering. All right? We've done the llama. Uncomfortable enough? Are we good? Do we need a little... No? Are we good? All right. What's an offering? <laughs> if tithing was tough, this one's going to be tougher because an offering, and, and you know what I thought an offering was when it said tithes and offerings? I can give whatever I want. I'm good. Blessings are coming my way. That's what I used to think, right? And I was like, I think I remember saying to Thomas once, I said, why is it called tithes and offerings? Shouldn't it be called tithes or offerings? Like, where's my choice here? What do you mean and offerings? You know, and it bugged me for the longest time. It really did, you know, because I thought it was a choice. <laughs> An offering is above and beyond your tithe, right? So at the first level of obedience to God, we're at the tithe. That's the bare minimum that God's asking you to do, to say, I want your heart. This is the bare minimum. And an offering is above and beyond your tithe. It's being obedient in following through if God asks you to give if God asks you to give right? it's not giving really nearly this story is going to challenge some of you if I'm walking through the streets with two bottles of water right, and I'm not thirsty and I see a homeless person on the ground who hasn't drank water in a day what am I going to do? any takers? <laughs> what am I going to do? Right? Am I going to give the person the bottles of water? Right? Yes? Give the person the bottle of water. That sounds great. I'm, I'm awesome. No. I'm going to pray to God and I'm going to ask Him if He wants me to give them the bottle of water. Why? Because I'm being obedient and I'm not playing God. We have a choice in that moment that we can either be God or we can be used by God. 
right? Because what I didn't know, because I don't have perspective, God has perspective, but what I didn't know is that there was a lady behind me with her last bottle of water who was thirsty, who God has been working on her heart, and I've just robbed her the opportunity to give to that person. All because I chose not to be obedient and play God. I just want to let that sink for a second. The goal is to be obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We have to be obedient to God, right? Because it's about putting God first in everything that we do, right? If you come and say, oh, I'm going to offer a little bit more now, whew, I'm good. You're not doing it for God, you're doing it for yourself and your ego. That's what you're doing it for. But if you come with a thing and say, God, everything is yours. Do you want me to give? Do you want me to do this? There, there is not a shortage of needs in the world, There's not a shortage of needs, right? But there is a shortage of your resource and your time. And the only way you're going to find out where God wants to use you is if you pray to him and ask him and follow his direction and be obedient to him. Be obedient to him. Because God wants to use you for his mission, right? You just be obedient in what you're being asked to do and trust God with the rest. Trust God with the rest, right? Amen. Be God or be used by God. That's the call, okay? Because if you go give all your money away willy-nilly and you have no money left, you can't help anyone, right? So what is our attitude in the gap? It's heavy, isn't it? (laughs) What is our attitude in the gap? Is it to give or is it to get? Church, who are we? We, as a church, are faith-filled, truth-seeking, spirit-led warriors of God. I will not stop going on about it. I'll say it every second sermon. (laughs) If we are to be faith-filled, we must follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit on when to give and when to offer above and beyond. Okay? Are we looking to give in every situation or are we looking to get? Here's a prime example. This picture, everyone's seen it probably? Yeah? This picture was taken in 1994, I think it was. This African child was trying to get to a food bank. Obviously hungry, obviously thirsty. The food bank was about 200 metres away. The photographer who took this picture, in this moment, stood there for 20 minutes because he thought that if the vulture opened his wings, it would be a better photo. He got this photo, he got on a plane, he left, he went to the award ceremony and he won an award for this photo. Six months later, the photographer killed himself because he couldn't get this picture out of his head. In the gap, this photographer decided to get instead of trying to give. His whole attitude was about what he could get. What can I get? What can I get? It's about me. It's about me. Right? If, he, if his attitude was just for that moment to give, he could still be alive today. This is important. God doesn't need your money, but he's got good plans for your life. He's got good plans for your life. He just wants you to step into his way just wants you to step into his way and I know that sometimes we may be in a really really tough spot and it may be really really tough to trust God I get that I get that trust me I get that right it is really really hard sometimes it's really really hard but we must trust God in the brokenness and in the blessing and I want to turn to a story quickly in the New Testament which may give us some principles about giving in tough times because I know it's a reality for a lot of people right and even, you know, we, we don't have to be super poor or, or, or super broken or whatever to, to be in a tough spot. We have, we have sinful desires that says we need to get more, we need to get more, we need to get more, we need to get more. That's why you see all these like rich people with all this debt and they're super stressed because they've bought the lie that they, more stuff matters. They've bought the lie, right? And as I said last week, stuff, possessions, money, nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it, right? Reading the 5,000. 
I'll read it quickly and then we'll unpack it. I'm sure we all know the story. Now the day began to wear away and the twelve came in and said to him, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions. For we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more, fi- we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we had to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. And they did so. And then, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And that was left over. uh, And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. So what happened in this story? This story is such a beautiful story. And I overlooked how powerful it was for so long, for so long, right? So at the start of it, it says, we are in a desolate place. We are in a desolate place. Jesus just finished preaching for like 14 hours. Do you think my sermons are long? No. <laughs> Must have been pretty good to keep them engaged for 14 hours. That's like the whole Hot Topic series, you know, doubled in one day, right? One day. Jesus led them to a desolate place preached at them for 14 hours. Do you think he would know they are going to get hungry? Of course, right? Jesus led them to a desolate place. That's the first thing to remember, okay? Then what, what does he ask them to do? You give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we had to go buy food for all these people. And he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. That's the first thing he asked them to do. Have them sit down. Jesus could have just fed them all, Right? But he's like, have them sit down. I always think this is funny, right? There's like 5,000 men, and let's remember that there's like women and children as well. So we're looking at like 20,000 people here. That's not 5,000, it's like 20,000, right? Because we only know the men that are recorded, yeah? So can you imagine 12 people sitting them down in 50 groups each, in groups of 50 each? Like, how would they do it? I just think it's a funny thought to have. It's like I asked, like, I told Sam this morning about my funny thoughts, about why chickens have wings. Like, is it just for us? Like, because, you know, they can't fly, like, so is it just for KFC? I don't know. But then Sam told me that they jump from tree to tree and branch to branch and really ruined my joke. So, no, I'm kidding. It's funny. <laughs> it's good. So, you know, just imagine these 12 disciples. I reckon they would use a number system. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, all the twos over here. All the... Mate, I told you your number. It's three. Go over there. All the twos, all the threes, and they'll sit in groups of 50, right? So sit them down, sit them down, sit them down. But what's the first thing he's asking them to do is to be obedient. Is to be obedient. Go tell them to sit down. Sit down. Just listen to me. That's what he's saying. Listen to me. I know you're hungry. Listen to me. Sit down. Sit down and pay attention to what I have for you to what I have for you, right? We can go to God with all our needs and everything that we want all the time in prayer, but God is saying, sit down, listen, sit down. And sometimes we have to tell something in our life to sit down, amen? The fear of the enemy, sit down, right? Your, your fear of whatever you have to do tomorrow, sit down. Your anxiety, sit down. Just tell it to sit down, right? You have Jesus. You have the Spirit living inside you. Get hold of that power. Tell it to sit down, right? And then what does he do? He says, what do you have? Give it to me. What do you have? Right? Give me what you have, the fish and loaves. That's all I had. Jesus said, give me what you have. Fish and loaves, give me what you have. Right? And what did Jesus do? He looked up and he blessed it. Didn't he? How could he bless it if he didn't hand it over? If they didn't hand it over, how could he bless it? He said, hand it over. And he looked up and he said, bless it. And then what did he do? What did Jesus do then? I think this is really interesting. He got the loaf and he broke it. And you might think that's like a a, a detail that doesn't really matter, but I think it actually matters, right? Because he broke what they had. He broke what they had. And I don't know what some of you have, that when you take it to God, he might break it. He might break it. Why? Why? Why would God break it? Sometimes you would go to God with your marriage or with an issue or because you want to grow something or with a business idea or with something. You would go to God and you'd say, God, fix it. And he might break it. God is sovereign. God is in control. 
And you might be in that spot where it's broken. You might be, God, I, I followed you all the way here. You might be in that spot where, God, I was obedient the whole way. I've been obedient my whole life. I've turned to your word. I've prayed. I've been there for you. <laughs> and he might just break it. And the reason is to give it to someone else. He might break something in your life because he has a purpose for you to give that brokenness to help someone else. He will take your small broken piece and he'll start using it to help other people. And you won't know until the end and you have perspective because we don't have perspective. God has perspective. He sees the start from the end and everything in between. All right? And he may be using you for a much higher purpose. He might be using you for a much higher purpose that you just cannot comprehend right now. But all you can do right now is trust God and be obedient to him that he's using you in the brokenness. And he's just asking you to give it to him. Give me what you have. Give me what you have. And at this level... You'll have to ask, who do I trust in this moment of brokenness? Is it me or is it God? And God is saying, if you just trust me as your provider, trust the provider, not the provision. God wants to show you. God wants to show you that he actually has unlimited provision. God broke it. He gave it back to the disciples. And then what happened? They went and fed about 20,000 people with their broken pieces. That's what God did. Because God has unlimited provision for your life. A little bit of obedience could lead to a lot of abundance. And we need to pour instead of store. And you know it's biblical because it rhymes. Okay? Pour instead of store. No matter what. Because I read through the entire word that God uses the people that were broken that gave him everything. Moses, broken. Paul, broken. Fish and loaves, broken. Because they got to the end of themselves And they realised, you know what, God, everything is yours. Whatever. It's not about the money. It's about our hearts. All right? We pour instead of store. We be obedient and we listen. He told him to sit down. That's the first thing. We be obedient and we listen. Right? It's hard for everyone. It's hard for everyone. It's hard for me standing up here to be obedient and listen that this is what God is asking me to tell you all. Right? It's, it's hard for me to be obedient and listen to him when, when you've got people saying, oh, you're too young, you can't be a pastor, blah, 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 whatever. Right? I have to be obedient and listen. Every time I come, right, I have fish and loaves. I give God what I have. I say, this is what I've got. This is what in my own brain that I've come up with, you know, that I've listened to the Spirit and you've given me to be obedient to the people here, right, and I say, in the worship time, I've said to you guys before, I say, God, I have fish and loaves, I hand it over, do what you will with it. All I can do is come with fish and loaves. That's all I can do. That's all I have. Everything has to be of God. I have nothing. I have nothing. I have what God gives me, right? God will bless it, right? There's something spiritual happening right here, right now, in this church, and I feel a spiritual breakthrough in the hearts, in this room right now. I don't know what's happening, but let God work, because it's happening, because God will bless it. The messages are only good if God blesses it. They're rubbish if they come in my own strength. Amen? And I feel it too. I feel it too. I remember one time I preached a sermon last year, and I had notes and notes and notes and notes, and I went through like one and two kings in like so long, and it felt like rubbish. But boy, it felt educated, you know, and it felt knowledgeable, and I had so many Hebrew and Greek words in there, and I was really happy with myself, and afterwards I was like, all right, God, I'll do it your way. <laughs> And you know the worst part of that sermon was halfway through, I knew exactly what was going on. (laughs) And God let me be uncomfortable for the whole time. 
And I remember getting home and just crying and being like, I'll do it your way. And it might just be a sermon, it might sound silly to you lot, but I just want to be obedient to him in everything that I do, in everything that I do, right? God will bless it. God may break it. What you have, what you give, God may break it because it's not about you. It's about God, right? He broke the bread to give to someone else. How beautiful. How beautiful. We pour instead of store and we trust the provider. Generous is not what we do in this church. Generous is who we are. That's who we are. We will be irrationally generous. Why? Because we truly believe it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. That is why. Right? That is why. Because we, as a church family, trust the provider and not the provision. Right? What does this look like in your life? I don't know. It's different for everyone. Right? Maybe you will declare the first fruits. Maybe you will just say, God, in the morning when I wake up, I'm just going to give you the first 10 minutes. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read your word. I'm just going to give you the first fruits. Right? Maybe it's that. Maybe you're thinking about giving rather than receiving and putting God in the gap in everything that you do in your life. In this moment when I go to the shop, I'm going to look at where I can give. Where can I give? Who's asking for my attention? God, you are on my thoughts all the time. It says pray without ceasing. Get out of the car. On the way to the shop. God, use me if you want. Just pray every time and let put God in the gap. I'm going to have an attitude of abundance. I'm going to have an attitude that I am a giver. I am a giver. I'm a giver. Maybe you'll get invested. Maybe you'll start to tithe. Maybe, you know, and if you don't believe in me and you don't believe in this church, you don't believe in where we're going, find a local church that you do believe in and tithe to them (laughs) because I truly believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Amen? And we will be irrationally generous in reaching our community. This church is on a mission. We are on a mission to be the light in the southwest. Amen? Amen? And everything that is happening and going on in the world right now, people are going to start looking for the light and we are going to be that light. Because they will look at us when we give, right? Not just in a church setting, but the entire week, right? You might see someone, you might be irrationally generous. And someone will go, how are you so irrationally generous? And you might reply, because of Jesus Christ, amen? And everything else in their life will not make sense, except for that one moment, right? It could save a life. God is asking us to be irrationally generous. He's asking us to be givers, of us, of our resources, of everything God has given us, he's asking us to give. He's asking us to give. If we read in Acts, we want to on about it on the vision night, how, you know, we want to be a church like the early Christians, right? They had no need among anyone. They had no need, you know. Our vision is that there's no need in here, that we'll be spiritually fillers, that we'll be aware of everyone's need, not on a surface level, but at a deeper level, right? And then when everyone's here, we might have no need in our community. We might have no need in our community. Church is not a building you go to. You are the church, and you exist to save the world. Amen. Amen. Can't do it without resources. It's that simple. But we want to save the world. We want to be irrationally generous out there. We want to help the widows. We want to help the starving people. We want to help the community, right? There's not even any special like Bible verse and acts about giving because it was just so normal. The early Christians just gave, they just gave, they just gave, they just gave. Let's get on fire with that, all right? Let's get on fire with that. We visualize a church as a family that start with the tithe and then give offerings way up beyond that, all right? But we are not entitled. We are not entitled, but we have been entrusted. We have been entrusted with this community. God has given us this region to take care of. Not me as a pastor, us as a church body. We are entrusted with the community, with our region, with this church. And we all have a part to play. That's why at the end of our little thing that we are, it says warriors of God. It doesn't mean that everyone has to get out there. It might just be that you pray about our region once a week or you pray about our church, but everyone has a part to play. Everyone has a part to play to get engaged, to get equipped. My job here is to equip you, not to educate you, not to preach fun sermons, you know, but it's to equip you to go out there and to be warriors. We will be irrationally generous. Why? 
Because it's just obedience. It's just obedience. All right? Amen? What would it look like in your life? What would it look like if in the blessing and in the brokenness you trusted God 100%? How could you be used? Oh, what would God do through your life? It's exciting. It, this is going to be exciting to see how this plays out in our community. It's going to be exciting to see how this plays out, right? Jesus was the ultimate example. It's a beautiful principle. The tithe, the offering, it's a beautiful principle. Jesus was the ultimate example, all right? I don't think you are commanded. It's not a ticket to God's love or heaven. Let's just get that out of the way, all right? But you have an awesome, awesome, awesome example. Jesus, who was rich in heaven, who didn't feel pain, who didn't feel anything that we felt, chose to give up those riches to come down for us and give everything. Why should we be givers? Because we want to be like Jesus. That's why. That's why. All right? The desire to give should be in us as followers of Christ. It should be in us. That should be the root because Jesus gave everything. Jesus gave everything. I'm going to pray. Lord, I just thank you, Father, that you are such a giver. I just thank you, Lord, that you provide. I just thank you, Father, that you sent your Son while we were sinners to come down and to bear our burden on the cross, Lord, and to give everything for our freedom because you loved us. Just help us, Lord. Help us to be a giver in Jesus' name. Amen. What we should do, let's stand up. Let's stand up, right? And let's, we're going to worship God. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say another prayer because I just felt prompted by the Spirit, right? I just want us all, including myself, and I want us, I just feel like the Spirit wants to change hearts in this room. And I think you should all be involved in that, right? And we should just, let's just close our eyes, right? Let's just close our eyes together as a body. My eyes are closed. Your eyes are closed. No one can see anyone. I hope. You better close your eyes, all right? (laughs) No one can see anyone. You get no recognition. You get no condemnation if you don't, right? But if you are in this room and you feel like, God, I just want to change. I want to be a giver. I want you to change my heart. I want you to change my heart. If that is your prayer, if your prayer is because you want to be transformed, just lift your hand up and we'll pray. Just lift your hand up right now. Lift your hand up and we'll pray right now as a church body, as a, as a family, Lord. Father, I just thank you for the people in this room, Lord. I just thank you for, for who is here and, and who might be listening out there, Father. And I ask that you do a work in our heart, Father. I ask that we have just come to the ends of ourselves, Lord. And it's just amazing that you just gave everything for us because you love us, Lord. And we just ask that you change our heart, Father, to be a giver for you, Lord. Help us to be obedient, Lord. Help us to put you in the gap. Help us in every single moment, every situation where you have placed us, Lord, that we just pray where you want to use us, Lord. Help us to change our hearts to be a giver rather than a getter, Lord. Help us to pour, Lord. Help us to pour everything out for your glory, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. We praise you, Father. You are worthy, Father. You are the only one. You are the name above every other name, Lord. We just receive that transformation, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's sing. (laughs) See a victory? See a victory. Do we see a victory? It's ours. Claim it. You have the victory. Amen. Amen.